It's 1954, and the people of Yorkshire's West Riding are about to see a very special show. And here come the boys. I beg your pardon, I mean boys. Believe it or not, these ballerinas are actually miners. It's hard to imagine any other group of working class men having the confidence to put on a tutu and dance like this in front of their family and friends. But the people we see watching, captured here on film, were not the only audience. Incredibly, footage like this was seen in cinemas all over Britain, alongside the feature films of the day. There's something about being a miner, being in the dark all day, that when you come out and you see the world, you know, you're looking at it with fresh eyes, and I think they express themselves in a lot of different ways. Here are miners creating art that wowed the London art scene. And here's a miner who writes plays. It was Clary Stafford who works at Steetley Colliery, and he was typing a play that he'd written about mining folk. We know about these extraordinary men because the daily lives of miners were chronicled by the National Coal Board's film unit. It began filming them shortly after nationalisation in 1947 and ended just before the miners' strike in 1984. Around 1,000 films record what amounts to the final chapter in Britain's long tradition of coal mining. Coal runs through human history and it's always been both a creative force and a destructive force. From coal came some of Britain's uh, finest achievements and also some of her mightiest struggles. The unit made every type of film imaginable. There were dramas, documentaries, animations, and even quirky training films. What's incredible about the archive is they, they recorded every possible technical, physical advance in uh, mining. Then all the social changes that have happened. Everything from how they use their spare time to where they go on holidays and the things they do in their homes. Rarely seen in the last 30 years, these historic films now offer us a unique window into the lost world of coal mining and its remarkable people. Britain was still recovering from the war when the Labour government began its nationalisation programme. On the 1st of January 1947, signs were affixed to all collieries declaring, this mine is managed by the National Coal Board on behalf of the people. There was a sense of a need for social renewal after the wartime struggles of so many. Within months, the National Coal Board set up its film unit. Clare Hall Colliery, Scotland. Among these men is Tom Syme, miner. Tom was picked for the British ice hockey team at this year's Olympic Games. This is Dunfermline Ice Rink, where Tom trained for two and a half years. Who wouldn't in this company? And this was Tom's last practice game with the Dunfermline senior team. Watch for number 12. That's Tom. Strenuous work after a day in the pits. The Mining Review was a monthly newsreel or cine magazine, if you like, uh, which was about 10 minutes long, a single reel of film, which went out to cinemas every month, uh, particularly in all of the coal fields across the UK, but also elsewhere. We know, for example, that it was certainly shown in London, in the West End, you would see Mining Review before you went to see your feature film every month. At its peak in the 1950s, Mining Review was shown in over 800 cinemas and watched by millions of people. Now, the point of Mining Review was, on the one hand, to reach the general public and to update them on the industry that they were now paying for, because it was a nationalised industry which was paid for partly through taxpayer money, but also to show them mining communities at work and at play. Each Mining Review generally followed a format, beginning with technical information highlighting the latest developments in the industry. William Thorpe Colliery in Chesterfield 
has been trying out a new kind of pit prop. Instead of being rigid, like the usual timber or steel supports, this hydraulic prop is adjustable to different conditions. This was followed by some light arts or music featuring miners themselves and their leisure activities. We sing a song as we trudge along. There's nothing finer than a song. And finally, a story promoting the various benefits the coal board were keen to show they were providing. Dust prevention underground is removing the danger of dust disease. But thousands of miners already have dust disease. The new act this July will give fairer compensation and the coal board and the union have been discussing other benefits. I first came across the archive um, when we were making the stage show of Billy Elliot. We got in touch with the BFI and they sent us some films. The amazing thing about the Man in Review films uh, is the just massive variety of subject matter. One wet day, the path to the loft was pretty muddy, so Jack laid down a lot of coal slack. His pigeons started eating it. And they've done it ever since. The fame of Jack's coal-fired pigeons spread far afield. Dear Mr. Bramley, one letter went, I am not a pigeon fancier, but I rather want to try the use of this on myself to see if it will help my indigestion. Another asked, I wonder if you would send me about five pounds of this coal. It may be different to our local supplies. I enclose 20 shillings. So these films show miners and their families involved in a wide range of leisure activities. There's all the things you'd expect, like brass bands, male voice choirs, gala days, but a lot of stuff you wouldn't expect, not just sporting events, but also hobbies. There's quite a lot of eccentric stuff going on in Mining Review at times. These are the miners and sailors of Workington. They're known as the Uppies and Downies, but originally the miners came from the upper part of the town and the sailors down by the docks. There are no rules, no referees and no limit to the numbers who take part. The Uppies try to get the ball home into the grounds of Workington Hall up in the town, while the Downies have as their goal a capstan on the dock side. And these goals are two miles apart. For nearly 200 years the game has been played like this at Easter, yet nobody's perfectly sure how it originally started. And when it's all over, those of the winning side who aren't in hospital have the right to parade the town with the man who scored the goal collecting free drinks in the pubs. And they certainly deserve it. I think as films, there are some really great documentaries. Some of the early black and white ones, they're beautifully shot. I mean, just as works of art and also capturing the era that's gone. People streaming out of the pit, that Eisenstein, Lowry world that no longer exists. I started watching them as a bit of a joke. You think, oh, that's going to be incredibly tedious. And actually they weren't. There was some nobility and grandeur in it. There was, there was great sort of sweeps of the countryside and the dignity of labour. And then there was one called The Shovel, which, which I particularly like, because it's in a way it's the most boring film on earth. And yet it's so portentous, they talk about the laying down of the coal seams and the carboniferous era when the great mammoth walked the earth and man invented the shovel to dig the coal with. And you learn how to shovel coal really well. The first is the way to stand. Keep your shoulders in line with the movement of the shovel and get your whole weight behind the swing. Stand comfortably. You'll have seen a stance like this before, that is if you're interested in cricket. It's the way a good batsman stands at the crease. His shoulder is well forward to the line of the ball and he puts his weight behind the stroke. You don't have to be a Len Hutton to shovel well, but it's the same idea. Which you start out in a way laughing at, but also there's something quite touching about them and they, they definitely capture an era that has, has now gone. It's a civilization that, that's gone with the wind. At this time, it was still common for boys as young as 15 to go down the pit. These lads are going to be miners, but how are they going to learn the job? Should they be sent straight down the pit where they'll be in everybody's way, or should they go to college where they won't learn anything of the practical side? The workmen in the Ronda are wonderful boys. They get to the work without any noise. They say 
say through the ronda, you never will see. Well, I started in the pit when I was 16. As my two brothers and my father had done before me, and I just went straight into the training centre. You could just walk into a job at in them days. I didn't feel that I was a miner while I was on the surface, to be honest with you. Mind you, when I went on the ground, then I wish I was back on top. They say through the ronda, you never will see a merry a lot that in Tipperary. Toodle toodle the best little dog boy that's under Jim Gray. The first time I went on the ground, and I don't mind admitting I was a little apprehensive. My father had worked in the coal mines, he didn't want me to go down. Uncles had told me the same thing, so I wasn't quite sure what to expect. It was fairly comfortable once I got down there. Whitewashed roadways, I could see everything that was going on and I thought, well, this is not so bad. I'll just continue on like this. Uh, later, when I was at the coal face, that was a different world altogether. Instead of walking in heights of eight, nine feet along roadways, you were down to three feet six. And it was ordinary wooden props, setting steel bars and moving them forward, having filled off a stretch of coal anywhere between three and six yards of coal. Oh, talk about hauling, it's nothing but fun to do it on the level as well as on the run. When I left school, it was the Thursday before Good Friday. It was in the days when school leaving was, uh, it was just being put up to 15 then. So when I got home on the Thursday before Good Friday, my mother says, Michael, your tea's on the table. By the way, you're starting to pit on the Tuesday. They may have been barely more than children, but they were expected to work as hard as any adult. My most embarrassing moments down the pit, and I only had about a yard of coal to fill off, mm -hmm. which was nothing really. So I'm, I'm filling away, and all of a sudden I see this figure filling away with my coals. Where the hell are you? What are you doing? And it was my father. <laughs> my father was a deputy on that f face, and he'd come to, he said, I'll just come to give you a hand. Yeah, and then okay. after, after that, I got all the, the flack from the fellas. Hey, he's got to get his bloody father to come and help moot. Oh. Way, cocky. Yeah. How are you, man? You're hopeless. So... <laughs> I told him, never again. Doesn't matter if I'm struggling, just stay away. For the film unit's crew, who weren't used to working underground, Filming in mines was a challenge. The real difficulty about filming underground was that the fireproof regulations were so strict. And we were limited, first of all, the camera couldn't be electric, so we used a clockwork Newman Sinclair camera, which you wound up like this, laboriously. The lights were not made for filming, and they were very heavy. It was very different from filming on the surface. The room you had to move around in was very much more limited. But you became used to this. The newly nationalised coal industry was hugely confident and secure, and the mining review films trumpeted its expansion and modernisation. Within a hundred yards is a coal mine that's been there for years. Now, a five-year reconstruction plan is to win more coal from under Manchester, much of which will be for the city itself. Coal carried many of the hopes of post-war Britain. There was a, a pride in these nationalised industries, particularly coal mining, and this can be seen very much in the animated film King Coal, made shortly after nationalisation. King Coal is stirred from his slumbers underground by the cries from homes and factories for more coal. 